We're back in Auckland Park in our studios here. Welcome to it. It is time for yet another robust debate on topics that, of course, dominated the news throughout this whole week. This is Media Monitor. We're live here on the SABC News Channel. Good morning. It's so good to be with you. I'm Alicia Jolly. Here's what we have in store for you today. We'll take a look at what came out of the NC's National Policy Conference. And will Black First Land First abide by the court interdict and stop harassing journalists? That's not the reports that we recently heard. The ICC has rebuked the South African government for not arresting Omar al-Bashir. But what's the next step? And finally, will Sifwambo pay back the money to Prasa? Find out all about these in a short while. But first, let's have a look at the news that are currently making headlines at 9 a.m. Disaster management teams have started relocating victims of Wednesday's deadly fire in the Johannesburg CBD to a place of safety. Women and children were the first to be moved to makeshift tents. Seven people were killed and seven others injured in a fire at York Building in downtown Johannesburg. The building will be sealed off to prevent residents from entering. England continued to hold the upper hand in the first test against South Africa by taking first innings lead of 97 and extending it to 216 by the close of the third day at Lords with nine wickets still in hand. They finished at 119 for one with former captain Alistair Cook unbeaten on 59. The protest had been dismissed for 361 with spinners taking six of the wickets four of them by Muyin Ali for 59. Right on the main desk, joining me uh, to analyze all these stories today. I'm very pleased to welcome political analyst Professor Stephen Friedman, as well as media analyst Mr. Melo Mahulejo. Gentlemen, a very good morning. So good to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's have a look now at uh, uh, the most trending stories on social media this past week. This is what we have for you, of course. Starting at the G20 summit, we do know that uh, there has been protests right outside, uh, of course, uh, the G20 venue. And, of course, uh, these are people that are marching against the capitalist. Uh, uh, they're saying that uh, none of the agreements that have been uh, agreed upon at the summit <coughs> have changed the lives of those people let's take a look at some of the tweets that have come through on this topic Yulia Komska says thousands came out for peaceful hashtag G20 protests in media images of Hamburg in flames are skewed. Very contradictory view, uh, considering that about 20,000 police had to be deployed to go and deal with that situation there. Jackie uh, says, uh, Robert Mueller, please investigate Trump as fast as you can. POS needs to be dragged out of the White House. Hashtag G20, hashtag traitor. And Webble says, it's strange how they protest against capitalism, yet those escaping poverty are drawn to these countries. Do we have any more tweets? There's a picture of Donald Trump there. And as we all saw on a Friday, of course, uh, he had his very first meeting, first to face uh, meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. And uh, M. Jennings here says, Trump thinks he is winning at G20. He has Putin's word that he didn't interfere and that he'll help with Syria. Well, Trump has sold us for words. Very interesting views, gentlemen. Professor Friedman, what did you make about the G20? Let's start with the protests. Well, I think it's a reminder that uh, despite the fact that Donald Trump has done things which uh, I think justifiably alarm people, that, you know, there is unhappiness which goes way beyond Trump. This is, this is not particularly directed at Trump. It's, yeah. it's directed at the idea that people feel that the world economic order is unfair. Now, the person who, who writes in and says, well, why do people go and live in the rich countries? Yeah. Well, that's not really an answer. If you've got an unfair world economy in which some countries are unfairly rich, then people are going to want to live in those countries. Yeah. That doesn't alter uh, the, the, the accusation. So it's really a reminder that the fairness of the world economy is an issue whether Donald Trump is president or not. Mm, but I mean, I think the biggest issue with Donald Trump was, of course, uh, the fact that he came into office. And of course, that big uh, decision to pull the United States out of the, the famous Paris climate deal, Miller. 
Yeah, for me, I mean, my interpretation of Donald Trump is that he came in with this approach of a businessman that yeah. can sort of bully other people yeah. into doing things that he thinks should be done. And he's found that it's very difficult to bully a president of a country because a president of a country has a constituency behind them and mm -hmm. that person's worried about getting re-elected. I mean, for example, the thing that you're mentioning now about him now pulling out of the climate press accord, I mean, what that does is that he's putting the United States on a sort of like an isolationist sort of path. And then that would work in a world where the U.S. is the sole dominant power. But then you have the rise of China with Xi Jinping on the side there also. So that strategy, I don't think it's necessarily going to work out. I think he's going to pin himself into a corner and he's going to have to retreat and come back into the fold. Mm, America first. We'll see how far that will actually take the country. Let's have a look now at another big hashtag of this week, of course. Uh, you are not the victims. You are the perpetrators. Now this in relation, of course, to the UK public relations company Bell Pottinger, which apologized for anyone who was in impacted by the work that they did for the Gupta-owned uh, firm Oak Bay Investments. Now, they did admit uh, that uh, some of its work for Oak Bay Investments was indeed inappropriate and rather offensive. And many South Africans were not amused or pleased by the apology and took to social media to voice their views. Let's hear them. Uh, Zilba Robach says, hashtag Bell Pottinger. What Bell Pottinger did is criminal and immoral and apology is just simply not enough. And Oscar runs on stumps, says uh, that is truth to come, says agree, disgusting, it's murder. Hashtag Bell Pottinger are terrorists to invade democracy and create warring factions. Hashtag International Criminal Court. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and of course, uh, My Africa says BFLF, uh, Guten Bell Pottinger puppet, must be taken to HRC for hate speech against other races, but I suppose they do what the masters expected. And Viva la Revolution says, guess the oppression of black professionals in workplaces across the country is also a Bell Pottinger passenger invention. Melo, what do you think about these reviews? I think for me, like the last one sort of like strikes with my sentiments because there's this narrative that Bell Pottinger somehow come into the country and created these racial divisions. They have unearthed things that were not there before. Yeah. And I think what the Bell Pottinger has done is just seen that South Africa is a fertile ground for a lot of these things because we have all of these inequalities, we have racial issues that are unaddressed and they've just stoked that a little bit. So to say that Bell Pottinger is the sole and root cause of all of these things I think is a little bit disingenuous. Yes, for them I think they'll have issues because then at the moment they've been reported to the UK, I think uh, yeah. whatever, Ethics Council or something yeah. like that and they're going to be taken on review for that. So from their side that'll cause problems for them. But in terms of South African corporates also, you'd be very surprised actually to go through the list of who the clients of Bell Pottinger are in the country. Yeah, very interesting. Somebody actually raised that point, mm. Melo. Professor, what do you think about no, this? I agree with Melo, but <coughs> having said that, I mean, mm. obviously it is unethical. Mm. You know, we've got deep divisions in this country. True. It's unethical for some countries sitting, mm. some companies sitting in, mm. in London making pots of money out of our divisions. Mm. Uh, and of course, it's not surprising that the, the, the apology is not taken seriously. Mm. Uh, <coughs> they claim that they were unaware of what was going on. Yeah. I mean, really, an international public relations company doesn't mm allow people to go and do things on freelance without Imagine finding that. out what they're doing. Uh, and secondly, of course, people will make the obvious point that they can afford to make an apology because they benefited financially from this. So I don't think it has, I mean, Melo's absolutely right, but it doesn't get by Bell Pottinger off the hook at all. Mm. Mm. So the PR stunt is not <laughs> Well, it's another PR going. stunt by a PR company, of course. Mm. <laughs> all right. Well, let's look at the final <coughs> big hashtag of this week. Ah, some serious reactions to this one. We all know that uh, of course, uh, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, that's the SABC, uh, announced early in the week that it has parted ways with the very well-known sports presenter, Mr. Robert Marawa. And his many fans wished him well on all his future endeavors. While some were not really pleased about his departure, here are some of the tweets. Let's have a look at them. There's his picture of a young Robert Marawa. I wonder where they found this one. Too Cool says, is at Robert Marawa replaceable at SABC? Me? Absolutely yes. No one does it better than him in Africa. Hashtag Malupoto. Hashtag Robert Marawa. While Kylie Shekumalo says, so hashtag Robert Marawa is left Metro. What a blow. I mean, he's a giant flawless and a wonderful broadcaster and Phineas Mohale says there goes the legend hashtag Robert Marawa and last but not least Lin Tswe Moswe Unyane says hashtag Robert Marawa people come and go in life uh, or people come and go and life goes on Marawa can be replaceable how is that what you think prof 
<laughs> well, he's a very competent and Absolutely, a very popular yeah. broadcaster. I can't resist, however, as somebody who's always very critical of the idea that Twitter speaks for the people. Isn't it interesting that the, uh, the parting of ways between the SABC and a broadcaster is far more important in Twitter than seven people dying in a fire uh, in the middle of mm -hmm. Johannesburg? Mm -hmm. I think it's just an interesting indication of yeah. where priorities are uh, among connected people in this country. I mean, that fire in Johannesburg was a sort of mirror image, thank mm -hmm. heaven, not as many people as what happened in London, uh, and it's virtually passed unnoticed in the public debate, and I think that's mm. very sad. Mm. Mm. Miller, quick one. Yeah, I think for me, like, uh, Twitter obviously becomes sort of like a platform for people to exchange trivialties and that sort yeah. of thing. And then Prof is right to the degree that uh, sometimes things do get overlooked and discourse tends to get driven in a certain direction. For me, in terms of the Rod Mara story, I mean, obviously he was a very popular guy on Metro FM and we used to listen to him in the evenings and so on when mm -hmm. he used to do his sports show. And for me, the one critical factor that sometimes I worry about is that we find that people tend to underestimate the brand that is SABC mm -hmm. and how much it contributes actually to people being the stars that they are. So that's Thank the other you, thing in terms of how it is that Robert Mara is going to play this out going forward, what other platform is he going to find to, I suppose, Play his craft, as it were. I like that point, Melo. Thank you so much. And I'm sure everybody does that. Well, let's take a quick ad break. And after the break, we'll take a look at what came out of the NC's policy conference that ended this past week. It's all coming up after this break. You're watching Media Monitor here on the ACBC News Channel. Stay tuned. Water-wise, water is an essential need. The scarcity of it could lead to loss of many lives, including livestock, plants, and much more. It requires us to use it sparingly and responsibly in times of need, failing which our taps and sanitation will not function. For more on water and weather issues, stay tuned to News Today, every Friday at quarter to five Central African time. SABC News, making you water-wise. All right, we talk about a healthy lifestyle, but what is this healthy lifestyle? What we're talking about really is um, you are healthy in those three areas of life, body, mind and soul. Before you embark on a weight loss um, journey, rather first speak to your person who has your complete clinical picture. Ideally your plate should look like this. Half of your plate should be um, fruit and vegetables. A quarter of your plate, starch quarter protein. So some of the things that I really enjoy doing for that bottom pouch as well as for cardio. So you do your kicks, you kick back. Join Health Talk every Saturday for all your health news. Yes, the NC wrapped up its fifth national policy conference in Nazrek, south of Johannesburg, this past week. The six-day conference was filled with robust discussions centered around problems with setting the party, party constitution, the land issue, and of course, the economy. Now, the party has lately been facing intense scrutiny from various sectors of society. The weakening of the party's support became evident when it lost key metros to the opposition and the 2016 local government elections. And President Jacob Zuma branded Monopoly Capital as a major adversary for black socioeconomic advancement. Now this is despite the decision by the majority of delegates at the ANC's National Policy Conference to reject calls to adopt a phrase, white monopoly capital, to denounce white dominance of the country's economy. Well, here's more on this insert. 
all power. It has been six days of policy discussions, but as anticipated, it's the leadership race that would top the agenda. A string of proposals in a bid to avoid a split, as happened post the 2007 Bulugwane Conference. You know, if, if we look at our history, very strong, strong feeling about my candidate, etc. So strong that the above the strong feeling towards the ANC can't be right. Can't be right. The experience of Pulugwan saw a very <clears throat> good crop of leadership moving out and forming an organization. One of the lessons there is that the winner-takes-all approach is detrimental to the party's unity. The president says it leads to a silent five-year-long war and now proposes an amendment to the ANC's constitution. Let us not get rid of the one who did not win. Let us make the one who became number two or who did not win to be a deputy of the one who is leading. <clears throat> this will have the effect that both factions will come together and work together on the two leaders that they wanted to lead the organization. The proposal means should either of the current front runners lose, they are assured a position in the party's top structure. But the idea needs to be endorsed by two-thirds of the delegation at the conference. If the murmurs at the back of the plenary hall are anything to go by, there will be a pushback from some branches. However, one thing the president is certain of is that this policy conference was characterized by quality debates. This was his last address at a policy conference as the president of the ANC. And if this was his farewell speech, unity would certainly be a constant theme. Wherever or whatever we do, we must ensure that we leave the ANC as united as we inherited it. The question then is, what is President Jacob Zuma's legacy? Aldrin Simpia, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, the critics have said that those discussions at the policy conference were far from being honest, Professor. What do you think? They were saying the real issues were set aside and that they were not dealt with. Look, I think, with, in fairness to the ANC, people have incredibly inflated expectations yeah. about policy conferences. You need to constantly remind people, policy conferences do not take decisions. True. Policy conferences decide on the resolutions for the December conference. Yeah. So if you go to pass judgment on whether they're dealing with the issues or not, you have to pass that at the December conference, etc. Mm. So to me, one looked at this conference for other things. Uh, and, and the two things I take away from this conference is, first of all, I think that the standoff on policy still exists. And that means that I don't think, whatever happens in December, I don't think we're going to see serious shifts in ANC policy this year. Mm. Uh, I think that there's too much pushback against that. And secondly, <coughs> what came very clearly out of this conference is, you know, we've been talking throughout this period about this big battle between the two factions. And what is coming out very clearly is that there's going to be a major attempt to work out some sort of compromise between the two factions. Mm. And I think that's what we've got to leave, what we'll be watching. As mm. far as who's winning and who's losing, you really only find that out when the branches start producing their nominations, which will be in a few weeks' time. Mm. Melo, what did you think? I think for me, one of the major themes that was pushed forward from this conference was the notion of unity. Yeah. And I think just to piggyback on what the prof is saying there, I think part of the problem with this unity argument going forward is that people are going to compromise in terms of resolutions. So for example, the one thing is maybe this white monopoly capital versus monopoly capital type of thing. You find that there isn't anybody coming out with a definitive position saying this is the thing. So we straddle both factions' interpretation. We'll find, call it monopoly capital, but then in the South African uh, case, we'll say it's white monopoly capital. So at the end of the day, it's like you're almost trying to avoid offending people. Mm. And it also feeds into this notion of two deputies or two SGs or all of these 
duplications that people are talking about. Because then part of the criticism that is coming out is that you're trying to institutionalize factionalism by creating positions within like the party structure yeah. such that you can accommodate such people. And I think part of the problem with that is that at the end of the day, the mere fact that you do not want to take hard decisions and saying, actually, this is what we stand for, this is what we're going to do. At the end of the day, you're going to have these things simmering where the ANC, you having like a minister of uh, trade and industry pulling in one direction, economic affairs pulling in another direction. I think those are the type of things that ANC at some point, they need to come together and say, actually, no, this is the stance that we're going to take. For me, the one thing that I felt about this policy conference that I felt was lacking and should have been the dominant theme of this conference is the economy. Because at the moment, we've had unemployment figures coming out at 27.7%, and like figures. people are unemployed, and then even looking at forecasting to the future, the structural drivers of unemployment coming up, whether it be from the automation uh, perspective, whether being South Africa being competitive or not. And I think all of those things sort of like feed into this thing that there's going to be a lot of social inst instability going forward into the country. And I didn't feel that the ANC is actually coming out and saying, guys, this is the plan that we're putting forward. I heard Minister Gigaba saying that he's going to come out with the plan for pulling us out of the recession. But then on some macro policy level, you expect the ANC to say, actually, this is the environment we're operating in. We are now a junk status country, or we're going into a junk status sort of territory. This is the type of things that we should be doing. Correct some, some of the policies that they're <coughs> advancing, I mean, we do not have the money to do some of those things. So I'm not saying that they shouldn't do them, but they should come out with a plan that's like, given this the reality, this is where we should be going. Mm. Look, I agree absolutely. But there's one thing I think we need to add, which I've written something about, is why has the rest of the country outsourced economic change to the ANC? The only organization that's talking about ANC, it's economic change at the moment, is, is, is the ANC. I mean, we have a major crisis in the economy in this country. Point. What has business got to say? What yeah. has labor got to say? What have citizens' organizations got to say? Uh, I mean, people must start thinking very seriously about how we change our economy, mm. make it not only an economy which grows more, but an economy which is fairer and includes more people. And that conversation is not happening. I, I mean, still on that, Prof, I mean, on those debates, particularly on state capture and, of course, uh, white monopoly, I remember President Zuma saying we need to define uh, the meaning of what state capture is. What are we saying then? Do you think there was a clear enough indication mm -hmm. as to what the ruling party is going to do when they leave the policy conference pertaining to those two major issues in the country? No, I, I don't think there's any clarity because I think there's partly the standoff within the NC yes. in terms of the power contest, right? So everything has become a proxy for that power contest going into December. So for me to give you an example of some of the things that I'd actually like to have the NC come out with out of this conference is in terms of like financing new people in terms of businesses. Yeah. So at the moment, there's this focus and this narrative building up in the country that the banks are somehow supposed to fund new entrepreneurs and the banks are not playing their role. But if we actually, the ANC did proper analysis and proper discussions and policy documents that actually realize that in this country, we need to sort of create some sort of coherent developmental finance framework. Yeah. Because at the moment, you find that all of the existing financial institutions, the way they're funding things, they're funding them from a project finance perspective, where they view each and every individual project as whether or not it's profitable. But on an aggregate basis, those things do not work because at the end of the day, like those type of uh, project finance requirements is that you need people to have collateral. It's either you have people that are connected that can get like sort of into deals on that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the ordinary people in the country are not able to be able to access such financing. This then feeds into this whole notion of that certain people have monopolized certain sectors of the economy. Yeah. So it's all good and well that as we come and we talk about white monopoly capital definitions versus monopoly capital definitions. But what practical steps are you taking to yeah. address some of those things? And these type of things where you have a developmental finance framework address some of those issues and they're not talking about that. You know, I asked uh, 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 some people there at NESREC about those corrective measures and, uh, you know, I got the same answer. When we leave here, we'll have solid uh, policies that we are ready to implement, but it seems like there's still a stalemate. I mean, if some of the top six members were still uh, uh, having different pronouncements on, 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 on in terms of how they would view uh, uh, the leadership battle should actually take place or the succession debate should actually take place. So I really don't understand what, what really came out of there as, as definitive answers, Prof? No, the problem is, I mean, Melo is exactly right on this. You've got what I call trench warfare. There, there, there is basically two factions who are fighting over how to distribute what we have at the moment. Yeah. And we're not discussing how to make sure that we develop the economy, we include more people. I mean, one of my hobby horses is this whole question of township economies, of people in townships and shack settlements who are trying to get in on the economy. Uh, the ANC mentioned 
mentioned it in passing a while ago, it's totally dropped off the agenda. I mean, this is a crucial issue <coughs> because if we don't deal with this issue, there is no way in which people living in poverty are going to become part of the economy. Mm -hmm. So I think, sadly, the reality is that uh, because of this balance of power within the ANC, what we go to see for the next six months is more of the trench warfare, mainly fought over parastatals, ESCOM now, Prasa, Danel, etc. And we're not going to have this conversation that we need to have. And that is why I say that the rest of the country can't wait for the governing party. The rest of the country needs to start having this conversation and start putting ideas on the table and start campaigning for those ideas. Look, let's look. I know we're out of time very quickly. I mean, let's look at the veterans' complaint and saying that uh, they're very disappointed with the policy conference and now pushing for a consultative conference in, in, in September. I mean, we heard the call uh, prior to the policy conference and that was not heeded do you think they still matter do you think they still going to have a voice do you think they still should be listened to within the ruling party Mel? i think for me like the veterans like their core i sort of like analyze it within parallel to the state capture notion yeah. right? because then if you look at within a democratic society how do you influence people the first thing is that you can start a political party and mobilize people on the ground but as the eff is finding out that's very difficult right the second thing is to go and find an already established entity something like the nc and try and infiltrate either the nec mm -hmm and try to influence things there, right? That also is very difficult because you need to go and consult branches. There's brown envelopes all over the place. That's also very difficult. The third and easier thing is, is to try... <laughs> <laughs> the third thing is to try and find a few individuals that are key within that organization and to try and influence those individuals, right? If you look at this whole state, state capture thing, it's operating on that line that, yeah. fine, we're going to find these individuals yeah. and we're going to pay them money and we're going to influence them. Yes. So if you look at the veterans, right, the veterans, they don't want to come into the policy conference and be involved in those discussions at the bottom so because it's very difficult now you're having to deal with 3,000 people and convince them of your perspective instead what they want they want a slow session with very few people that they can influence so it's almost like in the same parallel type of thing of how do you influence people so they want a special setting <laughs> such that they can influence a very narrow and close group. <laughs> a very quick one very very quick look one. i think they they tend to i'm, I'm sure there are people in the anc who respect them they they, yeah. they have an honorable record in the anc yeah. but i think this idea that just because you're a veteran you're entitled to run the policy agenda isn't flying and shouldn't fly. <laughs> All right, that's where we're going to leave it. Why is media freedom still such a contentious issue? We tackle that subject shortly after the stay tuned for more after the break. Winter is definitely one of those seasons where you can really show off your sartorial choices. You can start from a single layer of a shirt, actually starting with thermals, build it up with the shirt. You can have beautiful knits over the shirts, like we've done with Jay. This film is, um, tells the story of a very, very significant political figure um, in the struggle for freedom in South Africa, who happened to be uh, a woman. She was Nelson Mandela's wife. The exhibition is an exploration into black femininity. Um, Tabitha is a woman of colour and she is exploring the historical exploitation of the black female body. Newtown Junction Mall hosted an epic contest in the cold where three top South African graffiti artists battled it out for the opportunity to become the Newtown Graffiti Face of Master. For your weekly dose of entertainment news, tune in to Trends every Saturday from 12 to 1. And we're back with Media Monitor, South Africa's National Editors Forum, or SANIF, has won a court interdict in the Johannesburg High Court against Black First Land First. SANIF had approached the court to interdict the movement from intimidating and attacking journalists reporting on corruption and state capture. Now, the interdict was requested after the BLF held a demonstration right outside the private home of journalist and uh, Tiso Black Star editor at large Peter Bruce and assaulted Business Day editor Tim Cohen last week. Let's find out more on this clip. 
Yes. We are going because to protect when people are going yes. to die yes. in your presence. Moments after the judgment, BLF members hurled verbal abuse at journalists as they left court. I was doing specifically, I am doing it again by the same person who knocked my glasses off my face outside the house of Peter Bruce. She is right here in the court. She is with Andilin Titama. The judge interdicted the group from intimidating, assaulting or going to journalists' homes. We are now saying that it is time for the police to act. Uh, the court has done its job and uh, the police have to ensure that uh, the interdict is respected. The order further prohibited BLF or its members from posting threatening messages on social media. The group, however, says it will continue to protest. We are going to monitor these white journalists. Should they write any racist material, we are going to exercise our right to protest and to protest against them. The BLF has to post an undertaking on their social media to not intimidate or harass journalists. Hasina Gori, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, we're getting very latest reports that, uh, in fact, the BLF has not complied with the court order to stop intimidating those journalists. Prof, what should happen well, next? Well, obviously, the, the challenge is now to the minister. I mean, the minister has said, as he must say, that he's there to uphold the law. Uh, they, what, you know, whatever you think of the rights and wrongs of the issue, uh, clearly what they're doing is illegal. Uh, and uh, the minister must make sure, the minister of police must make sure that the court order is upheld. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of other issues about this which need to be debated, but mm -hmm. you obviously can't have a situation where people decide which court orders they're willing to, to abide by or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so particularly since the minister has, has, as he should do, been public about the idea that uh, he will use the law against people who intimidate on either side, so yeah. you can't stand outside people on the other side's home, etc., so now he's got to show uh, that he's able to, to, to make good on his promises. And I, I think that's where the attention needs to be at the moment. Melo, maybe you can address this. Is there any truth to those allegations of those certain journalists being racist when it comes to their reporting on corruption in the country? For me, I think the issue that sort of like was the genesis of this uh, court order was the Peter Bruce incident. And then the question that you have to look at from a scientific perspective is that it's supposed to sort of like protect journalists that are reporting about issues in the country and ensure freedom of speech, right? So if you look at Peter Bruce's article, was it sort of like a journalistic output that sort of like was busting corruption as it were? And for me, that thing, I actually read it, it's an opinion piece, right? And one of the very troubling things about that opinion piece is that there he's calling Minister Malusi Gigaba an idiot, he's calling Minister Fiso Butelezi somebody of low intellect and so on. So it raises the issue, right, that is SANEF now protecting the rights of people to hurl such insults That's at black people? And for me, I think that is very problematic because in this country we have a history of white men in particular saying such things about black people to show their incapacity to do things. And I think for me that is very problematic and that is very wrong. Mm -hmm. Obviously that does not detract from the fact that these guys now, they're going to people's private residences you can't and protesting and whatever. That in itself is wrong. But I think on the side of Sanif also, there's a little bit of introspection that needs to get done because there's all these accusations that the only time they stand up for people's things is when a white person is offended. But when black editors or black people, whatever, you never have this type of out so I think from their side also it's something that they need to look at. Prof, I want you to Oh, I agree entirely. Well. You see, the problem You see, the problem is besides everything else, mm -hmm. the reason these kind of activities are counterproductive is it actually closes the debate down and it actually deflects us from the debate. The debate we should be having is precisely that debate. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, is there racism in the media? I think yes. most, pe most black people in this country, I'm generalizing, think that there is racism in the media. Yeah. And I think they have a very good reason for believing that. Yeah. So the problem is that when you go and you, 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 you sort of draw attention to yourself by demonstrating outside somebody's house, you don't have the debate we need to have. Mm. That is precisely mm. the debate we need to have. Because I think that people have got a legitimate concern that what we're seeing now is a sort of uh, herd mentality in which you're allowed to say anything you like about anybody you like uh, as long as you feel uh, that you're attacking uh, the, 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 the Guptas or people involved in state capture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm very concerned mm -hmm. on a number of levels and, and, and I've been debating through my column, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, do we close down all democratic debate in this country until we've dealt with the state capture issue? So mm -hmm. I think they're very legitimate concerns, but clearly demonstrations outside people's houses and threatening people violently actually make it more difficult to deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Melo, I mean, as uh, as we continue with this, I mean, 
why is it that certain groups wish to control the media? I think because it's important channel to influencing people's perspectives and people's opinions, right? Because I think part of the problem for me that I see in this country is that we have sort of like a hangover from the apartheid regime where there hasn't been a proper account and a proper sort of like redistribution or reparations to that extent, right? And I think there's a concerted project to prevent any type of discourse that is moving towards saying that let's have some sort of redistributive uh, notion or reparations for apartheid. And th from that angle, it makes sense to want to control the media. So I do not necessarily think that the media is at all maybe sometimes not right in pointing out corruption that government does. I think there there's a case also. And then I think a lot of these guys have come in there to loot and so on. But I think on the other hand, we must not discount the fact that there is actually a concerted project by people who are behind and who own businesses and so on to try and influence the direction and the discourse that we have in this country. But I mean, with that said, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there's this notion in the country that certain media houses are pushing a certain agenda, Professor. And I don't don't think we've ever sat down to have a robust debate as the media fraternity about mm. those issues. When are we going to get to that point when we're having people that are protesting right outside our houses to say, maybe you need to have this conversation. I'm not saying you go protest outside people's <laughs> houses. That is totally wrong. No, well, my point, obviously, is it would be easier to have the conversation yeah. if people weren't protesting outside yeah. people's <laughs> houses. <laughs> we agree um, on that. But, but the point is that the conversation is, look, obviously media houses push an agenda. I don't think that is the issue. But what but needs to issue. happen then to, well, to, to guard against that? What needs to happen is that path? we need to have a serious discussion, and some of us have tried to raise this in academic discussions articles. Discussions or laws in place? No, discussions. No, discussions, place. because basically you want media freedom, because mm. if you start closing down media freedom, then you're in serious trouble because it comes back to bite you. Mm. But I think what is wrong at the moment is that we live in an environment in which it's assumed that the media are not accountable to anybody. That's that true. That you've got to rally around this, uh, you know, support the media because they're under pressure and you're not allowed to ask questions uh, about the biases in the yeah, media yeah. Uh, and besides the biases that Melo has mentioned I mean one of my issues is that you know the media in this country reflect purely the concerns of middle-class South Africans mm -hmm. they do not concern, reflect the concerns of people living in poverty at all mm -hmm. and I think that that needs to be discussed uh, shack dwellers do not have a voice in our media mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. people in the queues at, uh, for social grants do not have a voice in our media uh, and I think the sooner we we have that discussion the better because we need to the media is a public institution that needs to be debated and needs to be held to account. Sorry, debate or mm -hmm. regulations, Melo? No, I, I also do think it's debate, it's the more democratic thing. I think like a more pointed issue to this thing is the notion of ANN7, right? Yeah. That people have come out now, they're saying that you no know, ANN7 has a particular agenda and a particular orientation. But then the question that comes up is that which media house does not have a particular agenda and a particular orientation, right? Because if you look at ENCA, you look at Yes, SABC or whoever, they also have their different lens that they use to uh, report stories, yeah. right? And then from there, that also is informed by the politics and the vision that they have for the country. So for me to say that, no, because you don't like what ANN7 is policies. saying, or you don't like the editorial policy of ENC or whatever, therefore we must shut them down. They're not a legitimate house, and therefore they don't deserve the protection of SANEF or whichever organization. Same thing that's happening with Ultra Zero. Yes, exa mm. exactly. That's a very good point about Saudi Arabia now doesn't like the way Ultra Zero is uh, reporting. Now they want to put pressure on Qatar to to shut down Al Jazeera. I don't think that's right, right? Because if you're going to talk about media freedom and you, freedom of expression, you respect that, then you should let whatever voices are present to voice their concerns. Mm, but people are saying uh, the media often, you know, uh, loses that gray area between media freedom and personally attacking people. Like you were saying, mm. this was an opinion piece. But yes. I mean, it, it, it's taking a dig at certain people here. So that's why I'm calling for regulations because we've been having, uh, having these debates, Melo. Yeah, but then with respect to the Peter Bruce issue, I feel that I can come out and be robust against Jacob Zuma and say, Jacob Zuma, you've done one, two, three, four, Nkandla, whatever, whatever, and then here's proof, and I do not disagree with it, right? But for me to go now and start calling people people of low intellect, mm. especially given That's the history that we have in the attack, country, yeah. I don't think it's not just necessarily only a personal attack. It's an issue that also brings up the entire black history of this country and the history of oppression, right? Because that is exactly the type of phrases that we use to undermine black people, mm. to go around calling people people of, black, of low intellect. Then what, what are you saying? Are we saying that we should stop listening to the Deputy Minister of Finance? Mm. Well, I mean, I don't understand, like, what, what is the objective of that? And I think it's wrong. It's such things that people are not saying because now everybody's jumped onto this Gupta band and, like, yeah. we're all now against whatever PLF is saying. And I think that is wrong. I think 
these type of things are things that are going to lead us into an abyss. All but right. I think calls for regulation make the problem worse because what yes. happens is the media then refuse to listen to you because they say you try to close us down. Mm. Those of us who criticise the media are continually accused of, of, of lobbying for regulation. Yes. And our position is we don't want regulation, but we want a serious debate about the biases in the media. Yes. So it's still an open-ended discussion <laughs> right there. We're going to take a quick ad break. And when we return, we look at the ICC's ruling on Bashir's visit to South Africa at the AU summit back in 2015. You don't want to miss that. Kilimanjaro, majestic and mysterious, 27 climbers, 5,895 meters, five days, trekking in honor of Madiba and for underprivileged schoolgirls. In just five years, millions of sanitary towels have been distributed countrywide. The target to reach two million needy girl children by 2020. It's time that as men, we must actually pick one uh, sanitary pack. We can touch one girl through this initiative. SABC News will again be documenting the arduous expedition. The climbers have one goal in mind. To pledge support for a month's supply of sanitary pads, SMS Jillian or Tabo M to 42513. The South African team hopes to summit Uhuru, Africa's highest peak, on Madiba's birthday, July 18th. And the big news of this week, South Africa is seeking legal advice of the, the International Criminal Court ruling that South Africa failed in its obligation to arrest Sudanese President al-Bashir when he attended the AU summit in Johannesburg two years ago. Now, the Department of International Relations and Cooperation says government remains committed to the principles of international justice. South Africa has since revoked its withdrawal from the Roman Statute after its High Court blocked the government's bid to pull out of the Hague-based War Crimes Tribunal. Now, the Progressive Professionals Forum has also called on President Jacob Zuma to persuade all members of the African Union to also withdraw. Let's find out more on this clip. In addition to its finding of non-compliance with South Africa's obligations under the Rome Statute, the court also decided not to impose further punitive measures against Pretoria, which allowed for two courses of action. One, to refer South Africa to the Security Council, because it was the council itself that referred the situation in Sudan's Darfur region to the court in the first place. Or two, to refer South Africa to the Assembly of States parties of the Rome Statute for possible censure, the court finding that neither of these actions was warranted. In these circumstances, a referral of South Africa's non-compliance with the court's request for arrest and surrender of Omar al-Bashir would be of no consequence as a mechanism for the court to obtain cooperation. South Africa had argued two distinct legal bases for not arresting Sudan's president. First, that customary international law prevented it from arresting a sitting head of state and secondly, the host agreement it entered into with the African Union. But the chamber was not persuaded. No immunity needs to be waived and state parties can execute the court's request for arrest and surrender of Omar al-Bashir without violating Sudan's right, rights under international law. Accordingly, South Africa was under the duty to arrest Omar al-Bashir and surrender him to the court while he was on South African territory in June 2015. Sherman Bryceby's SABC News, New York. All right, well, to give us more insight on the ICC ruling, we're very pleased to be joined by Mr. Dewa Mabvinga, 
who is the Southern Africa Directed Human Rights Watch. A very good morning to you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you for having me. I'm almost pronouncing your Mabvinga there as Mabvinga. Hey, the things that we learn. Thank you for joining us. So now we all heard the ruling. Basically, the ICC saying South Africa erred uh, in the highest uh, 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 of uh, regimes. They did break the law by not arresting uh, Sudanese President al-Bashir. But the fact that they've acknowledged their mistake is fine and uh, they've taken the necessary correct measures. What do you read into this judgment, Mr. Dewa? Well, a very balanced uh, judgment which acknowledges that South Africa violated its international legal obligations, yeah. but at the same time it's forward-looking in terms of um, keeping the door open for South Africa to remain within the ICC yeah. and to explore the mechanisms of the Rome Statute uh, to move forward. So, uh, it's a progressive judgment and uh, it encourages South Africa to reaffirm its commitment uh, to international justice and to work within the ICC so that we do not have uh, other countries who look up to South Africa uh, seeking to follow suit. So mm. uh, a, a very balanced uh, judgment in my view. Very balanced indeed. But then what do you make of the calls uh, after that uh, uh, of, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Progressive Professionals Forum saying that President Jacob Zuma must encourage all AU members to actually pull out of the Roman Statute? Well, it is misplaced in the sense that we need global justice. We need more platforms for justice and not less. Uh, what is uh, critical is to acknowledge that perhaps the ICC is not perfect, but it has internal mechanisms to reform itself, and South Africa and others should use this. So the call for a mass withdrawal of African states uh, has happened before. Uh, but we have not seen that kind of mass exodus. So at the moment, there is only Burundi uh, that is um, uh, that has pulled out. But Burundi is facing serious human rights abuses that is seeks to run away from global justice. Yeah. But South Africa is not in that position. South Africa has nothing to lose. There's more to lose in terms of its high moral ground that it needs to reclaim. So South Africa needs to think very carefully and seriously and to recommit itself. Uh, to international justice and to uh, dismiss the misplaced cause for mass withdrawals because uh, they do not help South Africa's international image. Let's talk about that when you're talking about international justice. What exactly is South Africa's contention to say we want to withdraw from this aside from the narrative that uh, the ICC only prosecutes uh, African leaders and not any Western powers? Well, South Africa has, has, has pushed that narrative, but we need to uh, put that in context because if you look at uh, the number of investigations on the African continent, uh, the vast majority of those have been at the request of African countries themselves. Yeah. So, for example, in Kenya, it was uh, Kenya that actually has asked the ICC to intervene. Uh, the same applies to the Central African Republic. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as the Uganda situation. Mm. So we need to acknowledge that. So South Africa is, Africa broadly has benefited uh, from the ICC. But what we need to address are the global geopolitics that mm. are uneven and uh, make it um, uh, difficult for some of the most powerful countries like the US and Russia yeah. uh, not to send their own people to the ICC. So that needs to be addressed. But the problem is not the ICC per se, mm. but global geopolitics. Mm. So we need to put that in, in that kind of context. You know, though, when you talk about platforms for, for, for global justice across the continent, I remember when this debate, when South Africa started affecting, you know, the process of trying to pull out of the Roman statute. I mean, there was a lot of noise about uh, uh, the fact that the African continent needs to have its own African court to deal with these matters. But we haven't heard much of that from the AU. And it was sitting in Addis Ababa just this week, and we haven't heard any updates on that. Absolutely. And that is what, what, when we then look at uh, the how hollow the statements and the mantra about African solutions to African to problems, African problems. Because the Malabo Protocol, which is supposed to uh, operationalize that African court in terms of uh, uh, international justice, is not that they have, these countries, including South Africa, have not ratified uh, the Malabo Protocol. Mm. So this is what needs to be in place first. But if and when we have that, we need to know that uh, the ICC is a global court of last resort mm -hmm. with complementary you know, jurisdiction, which means that it does not replace the Malabo Protocol yeah. or the domestic uh, jurisdictions. So what it simply does is to provide a court of last resort 
where domestic and regional courts have failed to provide justice. So it is necessary to have uh, the ICC, the African court, and domestic courts that are strong and robust. Mm, but then, gentlemen, I mean, uh, <laughs> let's talk about this. If we're saying that uh, uh, this is, we, we, South Africa mustn't uh, uh, remove itself from, from international justice, I mean, the other big powers are, are, are not part of the Roman Statute. Why hasn't that been questioned, Professor? And I think this question always comes up all the time. I mean, the USA, why is it not part of the, the Roman Statute? Yeah, it's not that the ICC has flaws. It's that the ICC is an illegitimate institution. <laughs> because, you know, the analogy I always use, can you imagine a situation if in this country we had a rule which said we have a system of justice and it's only for people below a particular income level. If you're above a particular income level, you're not affected. Then it's not if equal. If Al-Bashir had gone to New York, there would have been no problem because the US hasn't signed the Rome Statute. Mm. If he'd gone to Beijing, if he'd gone to Moscow, <laughs> the same thing. So why, how can you talk legitimately about an instrument? Of course we need global justice, but how can you be an implement, in, instrument of global justice if the rich countries and the powerful countries have nothing to do with you? Mm. Uh, and, and I think, yes, it's true that Africa has referred these cases. On the other hand, the ICC has had a case brought by Palestine for many, many months now, and there seems to be no indication that that that's going to be pursued. Mm -hmm. I would be very surprised if it was be, be, would be pursued because the US would not like this at all, <laughs> and probably a, a lot of the other Security Council members would not like it. So, I, you know, if you talk about the need for a system of global justice, then that has to be a system of global justice which applies to everyone yeah. and in which all member states of the United Nations sign on, not something which simply applies to the poorer countries while the richer countries are free to do what they You do. know what I also found interesting, uh, part of that ruling, uh, Professor, they said uh, 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 the fact that uh, South Africa made a strong argument in, in the fact that uh, uh, al-Bashir was also not arrested by the other countries that are part of the Roman Statute, so that's why they didn't have to refer South Africa to the Council for further, uh, for further steps or discipline, uh, Melo. For me, I mean, like reading that judgment, I found it very interesting, the notion where the court sort of like positioned itself yeah. as the superior court of the yeah. world. I mean, there in the judgment, they talk about horizontal relationships versus vertical relationships. And the one thing that they say there is that in terms of the issue of immunity, Yes, if a head of state goes to another country, in terms of that country's laws, then that head of state may be granted immunity. But in terms of the international court, the international court is above all of that. So it has a vertical relationship where states have horizontal relationship. In terms of vertical relationship, if the international court issues a summons for somebody, then no law at the state level can sort of override that. And I found that very interesting that it's sort of like positioned itself in that perspective. Mm -hmm. I think another issue that comes up here, that's an issue that uh, Prof Mamdani, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani and Tabum they have championed is the notion of peace versus uh, justice or versus criminal prosecution because mm. he says that the dominating doctrine in, South, in the world at the moment is that you need to pursue people for uh, war crimes and all of these things with disregard to the notion of peace and political stability yeah. and they're saying yeah. that you sort of like need to balance those two things and I think for me that thing a good example was in the case of South Africa right where a lot of guys from the apartheid regime were not prosecuted because the premium was placed on having peace so the issue there with al-Bashir is they're saying that you need to have a balanced approach in the sense that if you just continually uh, pursue criminal uh, justice, then at the end of the day, you might actually end up creating political instability there, which undermines the entire process. You know, South Africa, a lot of people are saying, isn't this why they didn't comply? Because they saw the other member states not arresting al-Bashir when he was in their country. So, I mean, what do you make of all this debacle then, Dewa? Well, there are challenges, yes, but um, uh, peace and justice are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. It is possible and it should be the case that you can have both peace and justice. Uh, and in, in, t in terms of uh, Omar al-Bashir, uh, the obligation is there. There are complications in terms of the practicalities of uh, how to implement that. But in terms of the legal arguments, it was clear uh, that South Africa had uh, uh, an obligation to arrest and hand over Omar al-Bashir. Mm. Uh, but now, moving forward, what is important is to send the right message about standing with victims of abuses. Uh -huh. You know, let's not forget the victims here. Uh, the crimes that Omar al-Bashir is accused of mm. uh, in Darfur, the genocide, the war crimes, the crimes against humanity, mm. the crime... Uh, so that is important. We need to think about the victims and we need constantly to be sending the right message that global justice matters. It Absolutely. is important and we support it. Um, 
there are challenges in terms of the global geopolitics, yes, uh, with the U.S., with Palestine and Israel, with Russia, but that should not be a reason for Africa, for African countries, for South Africa, to pull out of the platform for, for global justice. Let's push for everyone to be on board, yes, mm -hmm. but not to push away away simply because we are not all there yet. Mm, or get the, the, the African court. I mean, yeah, yes, <laughs> get the working, viable, exactly. yes, <laughs> yes, The viable yes. option. That is Mr. Deva uh, Mavinga, uh, as well as Professor Stephen Friedman, Mr. Melo Mahulejo, all joining us for a robust one-hour debate of all the news that made headlines in this week. Thank you so much for watching Media Monitor. We return next week, uh, Sunday, same time and place. That is right here on the SABC News channel. I'm back in a jiffy at 10 o'clock with your news. Stay tuned for that.